It's the Eagle Community Television Forum with your host, Gary Shorman. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Shorman and this is the Forum on Eagle Community Television. The Forum is brought to you by Hayes Med. We have a special guest today and really a special program as we're talking with Dr. Mirta Martin of Fort Hayes State University. Dr. Martin, a lot of great things happening at the university, but this program is not about the university. No. It's about your experience, not only growing up, but how you made it to the United States from Cuba and some of the world news that is taking place right now. Mm -hmm. First, let's start at the beginning. How did you immigrate from Cuba to the United States? Well, um, when I was about six years old, uh, the permit came for my grandmother, my sister, and me, and perhaps that's probably not a good place to start. It's, we need to start at the beginning, which is when Castro came into power, um, af he, and several years thereafter, he closed the island, the frontiers, so to speak. He, you couldn't get in and you couldn't get out. He devised a strategy that um, forced the heads of households to go before the Ministry of, of um, the Interior to register the entire family. That was actually brilliant, and if you think about it, because all of a sudden the communist government has access to all of your family's information, who you are, father, mother, sister, brother, um, uh, grandparents, so on and so forth. And that was what was required if you wanted to leave the island. And so what the Cuban communist country did, government did, was they decided who was going to leave out of that family. They decided when they were going to leave, and they decided to what country they were going to be shipped. And the only thing that was allowed was the clothes on your back. No money, no nothing. And so if the permit came, and normally it came for one or two people or three in the family, not for the entire family, if it came, let's say, for you and for your daughter, and you said no, then you couldn't reapply to leave the island for another three years. So then the permit sometimes would come then after you did that, two, three, four months later, six months later, for your wife and your other child, well, if you had said no, your wife and your other child would say no. And so that was a way to, of trapping families in Cuba. I often speak about my grandmother because she gave me freedom. She took a leap of faith and my life has been a leap of faith after another one. I learned that from my grandmother because when the permit came, yes, we went forward, we applied to leave the island and when the permit came, it came for my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, for my sister and me. You know, in, in hindsight, you, you really realize the strength of someone. My grandmother was my age, she was 50. And, and she saw that if she were to stay behind, the entire family would get stuck. So on a leap of faith, with nothing than the clothes on her back, she decided that she would take a five-year-old, my sister, and a six-year-old, me, and would go out of the country to the country which Cubans had chosen for us, which was Spain. And, you know, God started to look after us because her family had built convents for centuries. They are Spanish descent throughout Spain, and when they went to Cuba, they built convents in Cuba. So the Mother Superior in, in Havana contacted the Mother Superior in Madrid, and it was the nuns who came to pick us up at the airport. And um, it was the nuns who gave us our very first coat. We went to Spain in, in missed November, and we arrived with spaghetti string dresses that I still have. <laughs> and um, with the first snow on the ground. And it was they who picked us up and they made a small room in the convent thinking that the rest of the family would follow. And eight years later, almost um, the family had not followed. And so the American consulate in Spain said, well, maybe if you go to the States, they might help you. 
and yet on another leap of faith, she came to the States bringing us with her to try to get the rest of the family out. And I didn't speak a word of English. Um, I had grown up in a convent. I had gone to school in a convent because, you know, in Spain, the girls go to school with nuns and the boys with priors. And, um, and I didn't speak a word of English. And like many immigrants, like many of my kids now at Fort Hay State, um, I worked, I went to school full time in high school and I worked a full time job. And so did my grandmother. My grandmother worked two full time jobs. And on Sundays, we'd get up in the morning and we'd go to mass and then we'd go to clean houses. And I saw my grandmother who lived a good life in Cuba. They were, my family had means, they were educated. And I saw her on her hands and knees cleaning bathrooms. Well, that has to bring a real change or a real different view from what we've seen recently in the news. Mm -hmm. Because, and that's what I wanted you to set up for our, our viewers, kind of because we've seen uh, our president down in Cuba. We've seen some of the Castro family down in Cuba. We've seen events going on. How does that, how does that connect with what you have been through and what your family's been through? You know, um, I woke up on Tuesday morning to the president of the free world holding hands with the man who for almost six decades had enslaved people with a picture of Che Guevara behind him. And I will tell you that Memories that I suppressed rushed through my heart and through my head to a point where I, I had to turn the TV off. And I was on my way to Kansas City and for the next four and a half hours as phone calls were coming in to me and I was in a sea of, of tears, um, all these memories just, just came forward. Um, you know, what the American people don't, don't realize is that there has been a nation 90 miles from American shores that for almost six decades has suffered in silence. Um, the you talk about suffered. What, what do you mean when you say it's suffered in silence? Because we don't see that. Mm -hmm. You know, we see the, the pictures that come down on television. We see that part of it. So describe what you're talking about with suffered. You know, the Castro brothers are communist tyrants. They threw people in jail because they wanted to go to church. They threw people in jail and they killed people because they believe in the basic tenets that we as Americans hold true to our hearts, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The memories that, that came back in seeing Castro and, and our president just were filled with, with emotion. Um, you know, they, they, they brought back, the last memories I have of Cuba, when we left, we were told that we needed to go to the airport. And to even further break down the families, they put us in what they called a fishbowl. And there was this four, this room made out of four glass walls in the middle of this great big room so that those who were leaving, who were called gusanos, which means worms, because that was the term, um, would be separated even the last possible minutes from their families. 
And so your parents, your parents are still there? Your parents are still in Cuba? Mm -hmm. Your family still? The whole family died in Cuba with the exception of my m mother and two brothers who when we arrived to the United States and I was getting ready to go to, Q to, to, to school at Duke, we were able to get them out. Uh, my father remains, uh, but the rest of the family died in Cuba, separated forever. Um, you know, those memories of, of my brothers who were one and two at the time on the other side of the glass, sitting in Indian style with their head against the wall, is still to this day plagues me, or, or my grandmother's hand against the glass trying to say goodbye to my grandfather. Those are the stories that, you know, the President of the United States wants to bring down the embargo. Of course it hasn't worked. And I'm all for breaking down the embargo if it is to put food on the, in the mouths of the Cuban people. But the challenge is that the hurt, the distance, the separation, the annihilation of the families, which he, they did by separating families forever. You can't bring that back. You can't bring back the, the, mem the, the, the fact that my grandmother sitting in Miami Beach one day received a phone call saying, your husband is dying and she couldn't go to him. You can't bring back the fact that my grandmother two days later received a phone call that said, your husband is dead, and she cried because she couldn't be with him in the last hour. You can't bring back the fact that my father couldn't walk me down the aisle, or that they weren't here for the births of my children. You can't bring that back. And so the president is saying, we want the remnants of the embargo to go away, and that's great, but where is the apology to the Cuban exile people? whose families were torn away. How do you bring back the son of that mother who went into Bay of Pigs to try to liberate Cuba, and when it failed, they were thrown into her medically sealed ice cream truck so that they could suffocate, never to be seen again? How, how does that mother say goodbye to that child? You know, how, how is it that we can bring back all of our families, all of those times that have been lost. One of the reasons that I came to Fort Hayes was looking for a family. And I'm thankful that you all, this community has embraced me. But the reason that family and, and, and faith are so important was because of my background. You know, what Americans do not understand is that when the Cubans first left Cuba, they were exiled. These were individuals who lived good lives. These were individuals who were educated. But they gave up everything to come to be cooks or maids because they believed in freedom, because they wanted to worship. That's why my grandmother left. And that's not just one family. That is hundreds, if not thousands of families that were involved at that point right. throughout the period of not only a year or two, but over a period of decades. Exactly, and, and you know, my story, if you ask a thousand Cubans, it would be the same story. It's in, and, and we, my generation is even much stronger in that we never felt what our parents or grandparents felt in that we were young. Um, but you know that for us, for me, seeing our president, the leader of the free world, shake hand with the same communist tyrant who took people out of their houses and put them in front of a firing squad only because they spoke about liberty, or who took children out of their homes and took their parents and put them in front of a firing squad or they were to be seen no more. They, they just disappeared um, because they went to church. 
you can bring back the, the ideals or the hopes of those parents who put together makeshift boats to send off their kids across the strait into the United States, many of whom didn't make it because they were looking for freedom. You know, to, to, uh, uh, March 22nd, to quote another president, will be a day that will live in infamy in the memories of the Cuban people because it was the day that the leader of the free world shook hands with Cuba's Hitler. And at least the Jewish people had some sort of, of, of resolution through the Nuremberg trials. Those who desecrated and devastated their people came before humanity. The Cuban people have had no such day because the same exact leaders that enslaved people, that annihilated people, that, that destroyed families are still there today and we're shaking hands with them. It, it, it is just, it, it's an unconscionable situation what has occurred and the fact that the pain that we have tried to, to bury now just surfaces. Um, I mean, four and a half hours, it took me to stop weeping. The, 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 my, my, my grandmother's generation, my mother's generation is, is, is just in total and complete disbelief that the pain, the sacrifices that my grandmothers and so many others did to give me freedom freedom has just been thrown by the wayside. Now, we don't need Cuba. We don't. Cuba needs us. Cuba needs the American dollar to continue to prop up the communist regime that has been in place for almost six de decades. And that's what we don't understand. It's, it's interesting. It's a novelty to go to Cuba a place that has been closed for almost 60 years. But you know, the Cubans turned to the Russians for money, and when Russia collapsed, they turned to the Venezuelans, and then when the Venezuelan, Venezuela collapsed, they're now at, 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 at America's door. Um, they need us, we don't need them, but yet the pain, the suffrage, the sacrifices of so many have been for not. You know, I, I was listening on the way back. They kept sending me stuff and, and the little, the tweeter had vignettes of the president's speech. The president could have had the speech of the 21st century, just like Don, Ronald Reagan had the speech of the 20th century mm -hmm. when he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down the wall, mm -hmm. our president could have said, Mr. Castro, tear down the walls. Let your people fly in and out of the country. Empty your jails of the Cuban dissidents whose only fault has been to scream liberty, happiness, the pursuit of freedom. Tear down your walls. That would have been the speech that would have resulted in applaud, in, in joyful exclamations from all of us because the leader of the free world was taking a stand and was telling the communist regime, bring down your wall. But that was not the speech that was had. The story you tell is certainly amazing. For those of us that, that don't know the background, that don't do that, I want to follow a little bit more on some things you see that has happened, if there's, there's any opportunity here at all, or if, or if for those that are there, what, what's a good next step if there is one? We're gonna take a break. Our guest has been Dr. Mirta Martin, President of Fort Hayes State University. Back with more after this. It's a beautiful day in our super high speed internet, great customer service neighborhood. Like you, this is where we live. In fact, our company is employee owned, so it's our goal to improve the quality of life for everyone in our community by delivering faster, more reliable internet, clearer, more feature-laden phone service, 
quality TV channels, all with the level of customer service you'd expect from people who are your neighbors. Eagle Communications, our community connected. Welcome back to the second half of our forum program here on Eagle Communication. Just an amazing story, Dr. Martin, about Cuba, her immigration to the United States, and kind of the storyline between here and there of some of the, the heartfelt, heartfelt feelings that went into the transition that we're taking right now in our country. Our program is brought to you by Hayes Med. If you have any questions, ideas for other programs, things like this that, that we can share on Eagle TV, let me know. Gary.Shorman at Eaglecom.net. You can also find us on Facebook under ECTV Forum. Dr. Martin, you, you, it's your story. When I hear it, it's, it's an amazing story about resilience, how people escape Cuba, how they manage to get here and, and do amazing things to become a president of the university here at Fort Hayes. But in that is the emotion that goes into the six decades of, of what happened in Cuba. Well, after what's happened in the past few weeks of, of President Obama being in Cuba, the baseball games, all those things that you, you kind of relayed to us, what would you like to see? What, what's the next step if, you know, we're at this point, is there, is there anything that you'd say, okay, here's what I would do next if, if to make this right? You know, there, the, as I said earlier, the, the embargo never worked. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Cubans used it against us. Uh, it was supposed to punish the communist regime. It punished the people. Um, rations are still taking place today. So, you know, my father um, would say to you, when he would come to the States uh, to visit a couple of times, my, my son Patrick is a very finicky eater, and he would cut some of the, you would grill the piece of chicken, for example, and he would cut some of the black of the chicken. And my father would sit there and look at him and look at him and look at him and he would say, you know, that that you're cutting away is more chicken that I get in a month. And, and that doesn't change. So if, if the people could get food, if, if their needs would be met, as opposed to having that American dollar of our tourists going to continue to prop up that communist regime, then yes, they, that would be, that's okay. They, they, they should not be hungry anymore. Um, the, the walls, the, the, the ability for relatives to travel back and forth so that they can come together is, is important. Um, again, that, that does not take away the years of separation. Um, you know, you, you, you spoke about the baseball game. Um, I saw a picture of our president leaning over and smiling as they're suing the, the baseball game. And I'm thinking, how can the president of the free world go on vacation with his family to the, to the island. It, it would have been different if the Castro brothers had died and there was a new leader. And he was there to say, okay, let's figure out a way to negotiate peace between our countries. But the problem is that he, that didn't occur. What we've forgotten is that the same two people who turned missiles towards this country four, five decades ago are still there. Whatever happened to the leper can't change its spots. Those same people almost started World War III and they're the ones that we now have forgotten? Those actions that turned this country into terror? We've forgotten that. So, a day of reckoning needs to come where these people, and maybe it's not in this life, I have faith that their day of reckoning will come. But somewhere along the way, as long as our president is extending our hand in friendship to them, that hand should not be in friendship. It should be in a loud summon to 
Castro brothers, apologize. Let down your walls. Let freedom ring. That's the message that needs to go out. It's a message that will not bring back the dead, will not bring back my grandfather next to my grandmother. You know, my grandmother, as she died, left in her will that money should be set aside. And her statement is that because she could not lie next to my grandfather as he was dying, that she wanted to die next to him in her, after she was gone in her death. But she wanted to do it in a free Cuba, in a free Cuba. That dream is still not there because Cuba is not free. And Cuba's Hitler still rules with an iron fist. Dr. Martin, I can't end the program any better than that uh, because you've told your story. You've told what it felt from your heart and your family, and I appreciate you doing that. Our guests have been Dr. Mirta Martin at Fort Hayes State University. Dr. Martin, thanks for sharing your story. You. I know if people want to learn more, they can sure give you a call and you'll talk to them about there. You have so many amazing things going on at Fort Hayes State University, and we'll yes, talk about that absolutely. next time we get together. It'll be a we, much happier day. Because <laughs> there's some amazing yes. things going on there. Thank you. You've been watching the Forum program, simply an amazing program this evening. Thanks for watching the forums brought to you by Hayes Med and by Eagle Communications, our community connected. Hayes Med is your first and best choice for health care. They're the only facility providing tertiary level services in this region. With more than 70 physicians and 26 specialties, ranging from heart, orthopedic, spine care, cancer, obstetrics and gynecology, wound care, rehabilitation and surgery, including the Da Vinci robotic surgery, Hayes Med is your comprehensive health provider for people throughout Western Kansas. Hayes Med, helping people be healthy.